Well, thank you all so much for joining us for the untold story of the famous doll test and the black psychologists who changed the world. Author Tim Spofford uh, is here to discuss his new book, What the Children Told Us, uh, in this uh, Zoom webinar. And uh, Tim's writing career has focused on racial issues in education. He has taught writing and journalism in schools and colleges and has a doctor of arts in, the, in English uh, from the uh, State University of New York at Albany. And I also wanted to mention, let's see here, his work has appeared in the New York Times, Newsday, Mother Jones, and many other publications. Uh, he lives with his wife, Barbara. Uh, they split their time between St. Petersburg, Florida, and Lee, Massachusetts. I'm happy to report that he's uh, Zooming tonight from Massachusetts, so that's great. And uh, just uh, a little snippet of the book, uh, Does Racial Discrimination Harm Black Children's Sense of Self? The Doll Test Illuminated Its dis Devastating Toll. Dr. Gen Kenneth Clark visited rundown and under-resourced segregated schools across America, presenting black children with two dolls, a white a one with uh, hair painted yellow and a, a, and a brown one with hair painted black. Give me the doll you like to play with, he said. Give me the doll that is the nice doll. The, this uh, psychological experiment Kenneth developed with his wife, um, Mamie, designed to measure how segregation affected Black children's perception of themselves and other Black people. Uh, this, was, this was both enlightening and horrifying. And uh, really, this is what the book is all about, uh, in addition to uh, the two uh, psychologists. So all, let me go to my numbers here, uh, 40 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Tim for joining us here tonight. And Tim, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert, for that introduction. That was very nice. Um, I'd like to begin by showing you the cover of the book. And I have a, a reason for that. I'm not just trying to sell books, although I am trying to do that. But the reason for it is that this is an unusual a cover for a biography. Usually of the biography, the cover has uh, the photo of the subjects of the biography. And this is about doctors Kenneth and Mamie Clark, and they're not on the cover. My publishers are smart, much smarter than I. I, I would have put the Clarks on the cover. Uh, they chose this photograph, which is a real classic photo by the famous uh, black photographer, uh, Gordon Parks. And it, and it simulates the doll test. And you see a little uh, black boy named Peter, and he is choosing between dolls. And uh, you'll notice that Peter is, uh, he's looking at the, the brown doll, but he's about to choose the white doll. And uh, the reason for that is that in this experiment, uh, two thirds of the children that the Clarks tested uh, they were all black. Uh, two thirds selected the white doll as the nice one, the good one, the one they wanted to play with. Uh, so in any case, uh, what I wanna do here is I want to uh, show you who the Clarks are since they're not on the cover. And uh, with that, Robert, would you like to begin to roll those pictures? Oh, oh excuse me, one thing before that. Uh, just to give you an idea of how we're going to do this. We're going to look at some pictures of the Clarks to get an idea of who they were, who their people were, because how can you know someone very well if you don't have much of an idea of what their parents and grandparents were like, and also if you have no idea where they came from. So uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at some vintage photos, and uh, Robert is going to uh, let those roll right now. Correct, Robert? Right. I'm going to do my best. So I've just spotlighted you, uh, Tim. So hopefully I don't reappear. And uh, let me share my screen. And this worked well in, in rehearsal. So, all right. How's that, Tim? Beautiful. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Um, this is Drs. Kenneth and Mamie Clark. And this is uh, either in the late 40s or the early 1950s. Uh, they met at Howard University, a black college in Washington, DC, fell in love. Uh, they eloped and there's an interesting story there. Uh, Mamie's parents did not want her to marry Kenneth at that point in her life. Uh, neither had finished their education. But in any case, uh, Kenneth, uh, when they eloped, he, he moved on to Columbia University. He was three years older uh, than Mamie, and he went to Columbia after finishing his master's degree at Howard. 
and he started a doctoral program in psychology. And she stayed behind in, uh, in uh, uh, Howard to finish her bachelor's and then to finish her master's. Their parents didn't like that. But in any case, the age in which we see them now, they're quite young. They're in their 30s, early 30s, at, 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 at best early 30s. They'd already been married uh, 10 years and they had already done uh, several of the main things that we know and revere the uh, Clarks for today. And by that, I mean, uh, number one, uh, they finished the education they needed to do their great work. And second of all, uh, they, had, uh, they had founded a psychiatric center in Harlem for uh, troubled uh, African-American children. Uh, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. They founded a, an integrated uh, integrated psychiatric center for children that was, it was in Harlem, uh, but there were also white, uh, Chinese, Hispanic children, as well as black children. Uh, these two people were avid integrationists, unyielding integrationists, particularly school integrationists, and they, uh, their mission in life was to have an integrated facility, uh, at the time in New York City, uh, there were no facilities to help uh, children who were troubled, children with problems of truancy, uh, bedwetting, uh, night fears, uh, a variety of problems like that. Uh, perhaps they were uh, showing a predilection for shoplifting. These were some of the common uh, problems for which uh, these children were, were uh, linked up with Northside Center. And the Clarks uh, founded this thing and they funded it at first on their own money and with Mamie's father's help. And they went out, they found lots of friends and so on, donors, and somehow managed to keep it going and it's going to this very day. It's an extraordinary place. Okay, so they did that. And, um, uh, and not, well, well, I also wanna mention that probably right about now, is the time when Kenneth is ready to start working with the NAACP on the Brown versus the Board of Education case. And this leads us to the Dahl test, which they finished in 1940. And in 1951, the NAACP approached them and at, uh, Kenneth and asked him to be their uh, social science uh, consultant uh, in developing the, in fighting school segregation in the courts. Uh, at the time, 17 states either mandated or allowed uh, school segregation in the uh, southern and border states. That is, these states had dual school systems. If you're black, you went to black schools. If you're white, you went to white schools. Well, okay, I don't think they had begun at this time this picture was taken to work with the NAACP, but, but they eventually did. And the NAACP um, used the Dahl test in part to uh, present evidence in, in federal courts to argue their case. Okay, um, Robert, why don't we go to the next picture here? There we go. Nicely done. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to talk first about Mamie's side of the family, and these are her parents. Uh, on the right is Doc Phipps, Doc Harold Hilton Phipps, and on the left is Katie Phipps, uh, Mamie's mom. They're in front of their uh, big brick bungalow in on Garden Street in Hot Springs. Uh, they are aristocrats of color by the standards of their time and in, in their caste. Uh, they were regarded as black aristocrats. And in Hot Springs, uh, that was made possible by the fact that uh, Doc Phipps had two full-time occupations. One was he was a doctor, and the other one was that he was running a 
rather big, uh, rather luxurious hotel for black uh, patrons. Why those two things? Uh, I know it's pretty unusual for a doctor be, to be a hotel keeper, but that's what he was. And the reason for it is this, in Hot Springs at that time, in the 20s and 30s, there were no hospitals open to black patients. If you became very ill, or if you had a, a nasty accident, uh, let's say a car accident, uh, frankly, under segregation, it was too bad for you. Uh, you were not gonna be admitted to hospitals in that, in that segregated town. Uh, so what would happen is the doctor would either go to your home or uh, you would go to his office, which was in the lobby of the Pythian Hotel, which was a hotel run by the Knights of Pythias Fraternal Organization, which sold insurance. And he might help you there. Uh, some rather well-to-do black uh, patients were well off enough to uh, rent a, a room, like a hotel ward, uh, like a hospital ward, a room in the hotel, and the doctor would go there and treat them in the hotel. And this was very common. Uh, I should add that Hot Springs was a resort city. As the name implies, there were these hot bubbling uh, geothermal springs. And given the uh, state of medical knowledge at the time, lots of people thought that it, taking baths, taking the water cure, drinking these waters might cure them of all kinds of disease. And I do mean all kinds. Uh, so there were these big fashionable stately bathhouses in town. And at this time, the 20s and 30s, they were all, they were all for white customers only. And there were the hotels uh, that Blacks were in. And at the time this photo was taken, uh, there were only two. And uh, the Woodman of Union uh, Hotel and then the, the Pythian Hotel. Uh, Katie uh, was uh, a socialite. These two were at the uh, center of a very active social life in Hot Springs. Uh, of course, that was a black social life only. And also, uh, they were so well known that they were at the center of the uh, social circle up in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, which was the capital, and it was 50 miles to the north. And Mamie, with them, would go up there, and she would uh, attend balls or or proms, dances, and she was a part of that, that whole so, uh, social circuit. Now this house behind them, which they built, had five bedrooms, pretty big uh, inside, uh, and it would serve as a kind of elite B&B &B for elite uh, visitors to Hot Springs. And so if there was overflow from the hotel, it was all booked. Some might come here and stay with the Phipps, one of their five bedrooms. And, uh, and perhaps if they were really good friends and really, really special, have all their meals in, in the house. So Katie uh, took care of the home. She had uh, usually uh, helpers in the house. Sometimes people actually lived in the house uh, to assist her. And she also helped Doc run, run the hotel. She was very, uh, very hardworking. Uh, the values that lay at the core of their beliefs about raising children was the importance of education, uh, the importance of hard work. The kids, uh, Mamie and her uh, brother, who was uh, Harold, who was only a year older, uh, had a lot of chores to do. And, and uh, service to the community, uh, furthering the black race was the way people put it back then, in many cases, advancing the race. So Mamie and her mom would often go through town and they would stop at homes, um, sometimes after church on Sundays and deliver medical supplies, um, food, maybe uh, some clothing, uh, whatever people needed. So Mamie was brought up with a certain idea of racial solidarity and charity in mind. So uh, Robert, why don't we try the next one? <clears throat> this is Doc Fix before he's, he's got an MD degree. Here he is with his mother in, in uh, uh, St. Kitts, an island in the Caribbean. And young uh, Harold Phipps 
uh, is not photographed here with his dad because his dad uh, separated from his mom and he left for America. Uh, young uh, Harold Phipps uh, at some point, maybe around this age, uh, went to Jamaica to get a, a college education and he became a schoolmaster. Hence his interest in education and, and the importance he placed it uh, in, in, in his family. And uh, he became a little itchy though, uh, impatient with the uh, work and the pay of a, a humble schoolmaster in the Caribbean. And he decided that, and by the way, he was a British subject that was a, a, a British territory. And uh, he decided to go to America and become a doctor. So he got on a boat, had 160 bucks in his wallet, and he uh, left for America. He tried to find his father. He succeeded. Uh, was hoping his dad would help him through college. His dad would not. His dad would not meet him. Refused. And uh, young uh, Harold got to Nahari Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee, anyway. And he paid his own way through by working part-time uh, and in summers as a uh, porter on the, on the uh, Pullman cars in the railroad system. So, um, so much for that picture, Robert. Shall we go on to the next? Thank you. Again, we're on Mamie's uh, side of the family here. We'll get to the Clarks in a minute. And uh, this, is, this is Mamie's mom's family. These were the Smiths of Wahoo Street, which was like a wagon path on the top of a mountain uh, that was still within the city limits of Hot Springs. Uh, Mamie's mother, uh, whom you saw a minute ago in that picture in front of her house, Mamie's mom is that young, pretty uh, woman, uh, Katie, uh, Katie uh, Smith there up on the upper left. And there's a brother, uh, uh, there, there's her brother, uh, 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 I've, I've seen your moment there, I've forgotten his name, I don't know why. Uh, uh, Harold on the right is, is her older brother, and uh, uh, Henry, excuse me, Henry. He, uh, funny story about him, Henry got a job working for Doc Phipps in the hotel, and he he was a ne'er-do-well in the family, and he uh, stole the hotel silver and skipped town with it. Um, Alf Alfred is the uh, uh, name of the uh, boy on the left. He's got blonde hair, and uh, he uh, may look like a white child, but he, but he is most certainly not. And he became a rather well-known well journalist in the black press. And he had a column that was called Cher uh, uh, Cherokee Charlie. And uh, he was in FDR's black cabinet, famous black cabinet. He was a high ranking federal official in the New Deal era. His mom in front there, that very beautiful woman is Mamie Johnson Smith. She is the woman who uh, Mamie Clark or Mamie Phipps Clark was named for. Uh, she died rather young, unfortunately, with breast cancer, and uh, Mimi was named for her. Uh, the little boy you see there with his belt showing, he is a uh, not a member of the family. He was taken in, uh, and this is pretty common in the 19th century. This photo is probably from the 1890s or uh, very, very soon after the turn of the century. And this was common back then and in the Depression. And is even today not uncommon in black families. Uh, and it certainly wasn't uncommon for the Clarks. They often had uh, friends, relatives, uh, people in need who lived in their home from time to time, sometimes for, for many, many months. Okay, let's try the next picture. Now we're with the Clarks in Cologne, Panama. Uh, the uh, the Clark family had a connection to the Caribbean, the same as the uh, Phipps family did. Uh, that gentleman you see in the suit there is Kenneth's grandfather, uh, Walter Clark. 
and he was a uh, rather well-to-do uh, supervisor on the docks of Cologne. Cologne was at the gate. It was a, a thriving or booming little port city and it, on the Caribbean Sea. And it was booming because it was the staging area for construction of the Panama Canal. It was right at the opening there. Uh, the harbor led right to the, the canal, which opened, by the way, uh, the very week that Kenneth uh, was born in July 1914. Uh, the first ship to take in the full trip from one sea to the other, from the Caribbean to the Pacific, uh, that occurred the same week that Kenneth was born. Uh, his dad, his name was Arthurton. Uh, that's the young man, uh, which it looks like he's wearing a boutonniere on his lapel on the right in the back row. That's Arthurton Clark, his, his father. The woman is not Kenneth's grandmother. Uh, she is uh, uh, Walter remarried, I assume it was probably because his wife died either in childbirth, his prior wife either died in childbirth or uh, tropical diseases were very common in Panama. Uh, many, many people died of malaria or yellow fever, especially in building the canal. Uh, and they died by the thousands in that hard work. Jamaicans, by the way, did a huge amount of that work. They were Chinese laborers. There were also a few whites from the United States of America, but a very large portion of the Caribbean workforce that went to Panama to, to build the canal was Jamaican. And these people had a tradition of sending their children to Jamaica to get a, a taste of flavor of their island roots and, and, any, and in a British education. Again, uh, Jamaica was a British territory. This family, they were uh, Jamaican citizens. Uh, they were both well, British citizens. citizens. Um, okay, can we see the next picture? This is Kenneth's passport. And at, at the time this was taken, he was nine years old. And he had uh, been sent uh, at nine, around eight or nine, to uh, Jamaica with his grandma B. Uh, he uh, went to Jamaica to get, again, a flavor of his island roots and a taste of British education, just the same as his as the prior generation of Clarks had. So he went with his sister, Eula. Uh, he didn't use this passport, but I should explain. Kenneth, uh, uh, his mother left him at, when he was four years old and she went to America with her baby daughter, Eula. One of the reasons why she left, uh, she left her, her, she and her husband separated. He apparently had a, again, for other women, but also he refused to go to America. Uh, uh, Kenneth's mom wanted to go to America because uh, she was uh, irked that she couldn't get uh, high school education. And she knew that her children were also condemned to life of really uh, not a full education. And uh, her husband, however, Arthurton, told Miriam, Marion Clark, no, um, a, a, a black man can't catch a break in uh, America. There's no way I'd get a job like this wonderful uh, doc supervisory job I have here in Panama. So the answer is no. So uh, Miriam left with her baby. When Kenneth was four, she left him with her her mother, excuse me, his his grandma B, and she uh, managed to make it to New York, and she made it to Harlem, got a job as a, uh, a seamstress in a in the garment district of New York, and she found a, a home in a uh, tenement uh, in a tenement apartment in in Harlem. And then she called for her son. At four years old, he went through Ellis Island with his grandma B. So that's the story of how uh, Kenneth Clark uh, emigrated to America. Eventually, he would get his citizenship. Okay, next picture. This is young Kenneth in his early teens, and he was kind of a budding sculptor. He had a lifelong love of art, 
Some of his closest friends were artists, famous black artists from Harlem. The most famous was uh, Jacob Lawrence and his uh, wife, uh, Glenn Knight. She too was, a, was an artist. And uh, Charles Pinky Alston was another uh, African-American artist of, of renown that was uh, very close to the Clarks. And uh, another was Romare Bearden. Uh, and sometimes uh, these other artists, uh, uh, artist friends, because Kenneth actually, uh, Kenneth and Mamie had several, uh, they contributed their art for free to Northside Center, the Clark Psychiatric Center, which Mamie ran, by the way, and Kenneth was an assistant for many years. And, uh, and it would help uh, raise funds to keep the doors open at Northside Center. Okay, next photo. This is Kenneth's picture uh, with his mother, Miriam uh, Clark, in front of his uh, fireplace, uh, uh, natural stone fireplace in his living room in Hastings on Hudson. Uh, he and Mamie, well, Kenneth was raised in Harlem and he and Mamie lived their first uh, 12, uh, most of their dozen or so years uh, of marriage after they married in, in, in Harlem. But then in 1950, they moved to Hastings on Hudson uh, where this photo was taken. Uh, I gotta tell you a little bit about Miriam. She was an extraordinary woman. She was outspoken, she was tough. Uh, she was something of an activist. She was a, a very active shop steward in the garment district in her, in her shop. And, uh, she had a very strong belief in, in uh, racial equality, civil rights. She was a follower of Marcus Garvey, the Jamaican-born uh, orator who led the UNIA, uh, uh, United Negro Improvement Association in Harlem. And he often held uh, big uh, lectures that he gave and uh, and he uh, uh, held these large uh, flamboyant parades in Harlem. And he set up several businesses, including a steamship business, a uh, printing press. Uh, he fostered the manufacture of black dolls and recommended that you hang a uh, photograph of uh, or a painting of the black price in your home. And Marion did those things. She was a, an ardent follower of Marcus Garvey. Uh, let me tell you this one story that Kenneth told, and that really gives you an idea of his activism, or her activism. Uh, one day they were in a child's restaurant, part of a chain, and the, this one was in, in Harlem, and they were not getting served. Uh, Kenneth was just a little boy. They were not getting served, and Marion at some point uh, she was on simmer and then she boiled over. She stood up and she picked up the, uh, the, the dish on the table and sent it crashing to the floor, grabbed Kenneth's uh, little hand and marched out of the restaurant. Uh, that's the way she was. Uh, I also ought to say, just like uh, Katie Phipps, Miriam Clark was quite, uh, uh, she believed too in racial solidarity and extending help to people who needed it. And there were very often people having meals at, at, in her home or uh, they would sleep at her home, stay for weeks, months at a time. Uh, she had a reputation in the family as a one woman social service agency. Okay, next photo. This is a picture of the doll test. And the doll test was roughly as, as uh, Robert, kind of suggested quickly, uh, a test in which black children were presented with uh, dolls. Uh, actually, it wasn't just two dolls, as you see here, it was usually four, two white, two brown. Uh, and uh, these they're very similar to these, they were baby dolls and diapers. And uh, they would ask the children to choose the nice one, the bad one. Uh, the one that they wanted to play with, the one, and finally, uh, the one that looked like them. And very often, uh, Kenneth recorded his, on his test sheets, uh, when they got to that last question, which one looks like you, 
they were embarrassed uh, or they hedged or hesitated. And uh, part of the reason is that they had just described the white doll as the superior doll, the good one, the nice one, the one that looked pretty. And uh, sometimes they said um, negative things about the brown doll. And Kenneth wrote those down on his test sheets. This photograph was taken by, as I said, this is in the same series of photographs that Gordon Parks took for Ebony Magazine. Uh, Ebony in 1947 did a big photo shoot and, and uh, series of articles on the Clarks, number one, the Clarks as a couple with, PhD, uh, with uh, PhDs in psychology, but also who had uh, set up this uh, Northside Center to help troubled black children. And it was um, uh, uh, Gordon Parks, by the way, a, a rather famous photographer in Harlem at that time, and he later became a filmmaker. And I'll bet a lot of people who are watching this uh, saw a famous movie that he made, and that was Chef. Okay, uh, why don't we look at the next uh, photo? This is young Mamie. Uh, this is in uh, Young Mother, 1943. So this is during World War II. There's little Hilton on her lap, and he was born fairly recently. And there's uh, Kate, daughter Kate. Uh, daughter Kate is named for her grandmother who is sitting on the, a settee right behind Mamie there. That's Katie, uh, uh, Katie Phipps. And Hilton was named partly for his grandfather. Uh, uh, Doc Phipps' middle name was Hilton. His first name is Harold. And so we have uh, Hilton here. Uh, I should tell you about maybe something really extraordinary and do not, though I often mention Kenneth in this presentation, do not think that Mamie was uh, second fiddle to Kenneth. Mamie was brilliant and she was very, very energetic. She was not a, a stay at home housewife by any means. She worked full time for decades running Northside Center as the Head, the head administrator there. Uh, the, the Clarks did many, many things in life uh, that won them fame, and uh, Mamie was in the thick of all of them. Uh, they were full partners. Um, okay, let's go on to the next photo. Uh, the next one, the next. Hmm. There should be one more. Uh, one second, Tim. Uh, not to worry if there's any problem. We Yeah, okay, good. Uh, this is the Clarks later in life in the late 1970s. Hmm. All right. Well, I can't do it full screen. That, that's the best you got. We, well, it's beautiful. Okay. Uh, here are the Clarks uh, later in life. Uh, Kenneth has just retired from City University of New York, where he taught for more than 30 years. Uh, he, he, uh, most of that time he spent, um, the vast majority of that time he spent at City College in Harlem. Uh, and uh, he retired also from uh, America's first black think tank, uh, the Metropolitan Applied Research uh, Center excuse me, which he uh, established in Harlem with uh, millions of dollars in foundation funds, I might add. Uh, many industries uh, uh, fund think tanks to further their industrial and uh, commercial and political goals. And Kenneth, what he decided to do is he felt that Black America deserved a Black think tank to advocate government and corporate policies, uh, uh, regulatory policies that favored uh, poor, poor and minority people. That included, um, and also women. Uh, in the 1970s, women were beginning to get promotions and beginning to file suit when they weren't getting promotions or they weren't getting hired. And, and Kenneth ran a firm to further the goals of affirmative action for women and minorities in general. Uh, and to assist in mediating conflicts. That is the kind of firm it was. He and Hilton 
work full time in that uh, consulting firm, and Mamie and Kate work part time in it. And that's the end of the pictures. And now Robert has some questions for me. All right. Let me stop sharing my screen. All right, so folks, um, I uh, do have so, so in the in in I, I'm a fully transparent person. I did not have an opportunity to read Tim's book, but I have researched the topic. I come up, I came up with some questions. Tim provided me with some additional questions, and uh, away we go here. And while I'm asking questions, uh, please uh, type your own questions into the Q and A, and I promise I will sprinkle those in. Uh, so my first question to you, Tim, is how did you get interested in the Clarks and their doll test? Probably like an off, <clears throat> like an awful lot of people. <clears throat> I uh, was, let, I'm just going to gulp some water here. <laughs> like a lot of people, I learned through a psychology course. I was a freshman, 17 years old, in a college near the Canadian border. In a great big lecture hall that was an old, actually it was an old auditorium that was very dark. And up on the very well, brightly lit stage was my young, attractive uh, college uh, psychology professor, Dr. Dustin. And he talked about the doll test and, and uh, Kenneth Clark. And I was fascinated by this experiment. Never forgot Kenneth's name. And Kenneth was the kind of guy who, Practically, um, he was in the newspapers constantly. So it wasn't hard to follow his career. Mm -hmm. uh, he was on the front page of the New York Times and in the inside pages, and sometimes wrote for the magazine section so often that I kind of thought, I think he might have rented space in the paper. Uh, and, but also in regional newspapers. Uh, his doings were in newspapers all over the country. He was the Henry Louis Gates Jr. of our, um, of his day, uh, he was ubiquitous. And uh, so in any case, uh, I became a reporter after teaching college for several years in, in, in high school, uh, journalism, and writing uh, in bo on both levels. Uh, I became a journalist, decided to, to do, do the job and I was covering education. Kenneth was on the State Board of Regents, which is this powerful policy making board for all universities and all uh, colleges and all uh, schools, private or public in the state of New York, very powerful board, important seat. And he was on that, he was on that board and I covered it and I met him and I'll never forget. Uh, first time I interviewed him, I expressed my condolences because Mamie had fairly recently died mm -hmm. and, and he put his hands on his stomach and said, oh, I feel like I've lost an organ. I knew his story, I knew Mamie's story, uh, very superficially, but I knew, and I thought, there's gotta be a book. This, this, these are two historic figures. Somebody's gotta write their story. And uh, you, you touched on this uh, during the uh, slides, but just to kind of reset, um, uh, what exactly was the doll test? And uh, how did it work? Uh, the doll test uh, uh, worked this way. Kenneth put four dolls in front of a child, a black child, always a black child. And he began the testing, by the way, in Springfield, Massachusetts, our state. Uh, and um, he, he did this in the Barrow School, the Eastern Avenue School, the Hooker, Hooker School. Um, uh, those are some of the schools that he, that he did this. And he would show the four dolls. And they were in a staggered, integrated lineup, uh, black, white, black, white. And he would say, uh, which, is, which is the doll? Or give me or show me the, uh, the doll that uh, is the nice doll. Show me the, the doll that's the bad doll. Show me the one that you like best, the one that you would want to play with. And then there was that final tough question which one looks like you? And that's roughly simply how it worked. Uh, there's a more to it. There was a little more to it. It was an IQ test to judge whether uh, the child was really fully capable at two years old or even at eight years old to answer these questions. Um, 
And there was a drawing test that Mamie uh, devised. It was her innovation. Uh, and that was, and by the way, she worked on all this, developing this test. She was fully involved. In fact, she did, probably did more work on the doll test than Kenneth did. Uh, because she tabulated all that data. Uh, he sat down, true, with the children and tested the children, but she digested all the data, put it in a tabular form, uh, broke it down by age, by race, by gender, uh, by region, because Kenneth began in Springfield, Massachusetts, in, a, in integrated schools, uh, and he wanted to do the second round of testing in Arkansas in Mamie's hometown, Hot Springs, where the schools were strictly, rigidly segregated. He wanted to see if he'd come up with different data. And so there was also uh, some pictures of white boys and white girls. Uh, and that was also uh, a part, you know, they would select which one looks like you, uh, which one would you rather play with and so on. So we had, really kind of three tests, but the one that captured everyone's imagination was the doll test. The one that really Kenneth favored was, interestingly, his wife's test, the, the coloring test. Uh, and so, um, I guess, big picture, uh, why, why is the doll test uh, today considered so historic? It's regarded historic because uh, when let me just preface this by saying that Kenneth in 1950 was invited by the Truman White House to write a report on prejudice in children for this huge annual uh, conference that lasted several days, uh, trying to ponder uh, the problems of America's children. So these would always begin in the, in the initial year of a decade, 19. Uh, 10, I think, was the first, and right up to 1950, and, uh, and, and I think we still, we may still do those things. We, we're definitely doing them in the 60s. Uh, so his report, what he did was he boiled down all the research like the Dahl test, similar to the Dahl test, uh, from social scientists uh, looking at prejudice and its impact on children of various kinds and on minorities of various kinds. So uh, that study looked at uh, the harmful uh, detrimental effects of prejudice on Italian Americans, um, Mexican Americans, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Inuit or Eskimo, or whichever term you prefer, uh, those people. Uh, uh, so, I mean, and, Jew and, and Jewish people. And he wrapped them all together in a report. When the NAACP found out, um, about a year later, that's when they approached Kent and said, can you help us in the legal struggle to end school segregation? And he said, I don't know, read this report. And the NAACP read it. And uh, the lawyer said, you know, this couldn't have been better if it could have been written for us. And uh, so then Kenneth becomes the consultant who helps the NAACP choose expert witnesses from around the country, experts to testify in four state trials, uh, federal courts, Delaware, Virginia, South Carolina, and Kansas. And Kenneth was the star uh, witness in three out of those four states for the NAACP. And he conducted the dial test in three of those states. Uh, so that is now 11 years after the initial doll test. So he goes into the schools and he tests children again, and he reports in court on his results in, in, those, local, uh, in those local trials in federal court. So eventually this was all wrapped up in, in, in one package that we now call Brown versus the Board of Education. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled, and this is shock, almost shocking today especially, unanimously that school segregation was unconstitutional. School segregation, that is, in which you have dual school systems for the two races, that that was unconstitutional. So that is the biggest, the most momentous uh, Supreme Court decision of the 20th century. It set the table 
for integrating public accommodations, that is like hotels, hospitals, restaurants, cafes, uh, buses, and, and so on and so forth throughout the nation. And also voting, to make voting legal for black people. That, all that, those changes didn't happen until the 1960s. But Brown versus Board of Education set the table for it. And Kenneth helped the NAACP focus by focusing on this narrow goal of damage. Lawyers, you know, like to prove damage to win a lawsuit. That's what they did. They used Kenneth's ideas and his evidence and his witnesses that he put together and win that case. And that's when Kenneth's name entered the pantheon of great African-Americans. And so the Clarks are known for the Dahl test uh, and uh, the impact that that had on the uh, Brown versus the Board of Education ruling. Uh, are they renowned for anything else? Uh, less so, but for Northside Center, which became, uh, which, which became uh, a kind of model for uh, similar agencies across the country. Uh, people from all over the country would go to the Harlem uh, Northside Center uh, that they ran, and they would uh, look at it and try to figure out what they could adopt and bring home and open up an agency like that of their own. These were called uh, child guidance centers uh, later on in the, like the 50s and 60s. So there was that. Mamie helped found Head Start. She was one of only 12 people that founded Head Start. And they formed a committee that got, they had no secretaries. They had no aides running around for them. They sat down and they hashed out all the guidelines for running Head Start centers nationwide. All this began in 1965 with a summer program called uh, Project Head Start. But then soon afterwards, it became a full year, year round project. And Mamie and, and other, the other 12 went all over the country uh, examining, uh, inspecting these centers to see how well they were run and so on. That is a huge con uh, contribution. Mamie uh, also built this gigantic uh, housing and uh, 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 600 housing unit and office complex at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 110th Street in Harlem. And that's right near Central Park. And uh, it was an integrated housing complex. Uh, and she wanted to try to foster uh, development and integration in Harlem through that gateway. She called it the gateway to Harlem, Fifth Avenue and 110th Street. Uh, so these are some of the, I mean, I can't sum up all the big things they did, but that's a pretty good bite of it. Kenneth was the, and I think I said before, the most prominent black scholar in America in his day. Uh, he was in the, on television constantly. He was in the press all the time. He was a tireless advocate of school integration. Uh, he was, uh, he fought the Nixon administration, which was trying to stop busing. Uh, he was an, uh, an ardent advocate of busing for the purpose of school integration. Uh, two movies uh, have been made about this, the uh, three, excuse me, three movies, all, all or in part, have been made about uh, the Dow test, the Clarks, and Brown versus the Board of Education. So, uh, and in their day, in the 60s and 70s, the Clarks were among the most uh, famous Black couples in America, and less so today, and that's because we Americans have short memories. And what I'm trying to do here with this biography is refreshing memories. If you know them off the top of your head, what are the names of the three films? Uh, separate but equal. I think Sidney Poitier is in that. Sure. Uh, uh, Simple Justice. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember who would be. Uh, the guy who played Kenneth in that was Giancarlo Esposito. I remember that. There's a scene with Mamie in the Supreme Court showing them sitting down in the Supreme Court. Uh, the third one was Thurgood, uh, and that was Lawrence Fishburne play. It's a one-man 
uh, play that played on Broadway and a yes. one-man movie that was on HBO yes. that they run from time to time. And right. he played he played Thurgood Marshall. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to fast forward here a little bit here. Uh, talk modern day. Um, do, and, and actually, this question was addressed in the chat as well. Uh, do researchers still conduct the doll test today? And if so, what are the test results like? It's conducted, and this is another reason why they're historic figures. The doll test helped create a whole field of, of scholarly inquiry, uh, and, and that is uh, racial identity studies. Excuse me. It didn't end with the Clarks. All kinds of people have done studies like the Dahl test. And, and uh, Dahl test is conducted all over the world and all over our country. Uh, the last new one that I hadn't known about was in Italy. Someone did the Dahl test on uh, black children in, in Italy. I don't think white children are part of that testing. But if you go on YouTube, you can find out. But also uh, testing in Australia, New Zealand, um, even South Africa, I think Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and I'm sure other places that I, I just don't know about. And what are the results like? Uh, well, we often forget critics of the Clarks and their work was controversial. Right. Uh, it wasn't all that controversial except among segregationists in the 1950s because they were ticked because it helped uh, win the Brown ruling. Right. Uh, helped, I didn't say it won it. Uh, uh, but then in the 60s uh, with the Black Pride movement, uh, Kenneth kind of got a, in particular because he was the most outspoken, he was a best-selling writer, the author of Dark Ghetto, and in Dark Ghetto, he used the expression, uh, the uh, pathology of the ghetto, which sounds pretty negative. And he used the expression often of the inferiority complex. He was uh, black, and he didn't use the term black inferiority complex, but he often, he often said that uh, African-Americans suffered from an inferiority complex because of segregation and discrimination. Well, with the Black Pride movement, we began to see uh, kind of a revulsion welling up among some Blacks against that, those ideas, those concepts, those words. And that is why the Dahl test and the Clarks are rather controversial today. Around in the late 60s, with the Dahl test done around then in the 70s and 80s, those test results for black people, black children, tended to be different. They tended to show more pride, more self-esteem. And, and, and it's usually attributed to the fact of the black pride movement and the black power movement. Uh, after that, uh, I have to say that uh, another development was, and it wasn't just after that, even before the 60s, uh, researchers began giving the test to white kids. And those, I don't think anybody would argue there's been an extraordinary change in those white kids' results. They're still discouraging. If you hear the things that white kids say about that brown doll, that is not uh, something that makes you happy. So folks, we're gonna take a couple of more questions. Uh, and as we start to wind down, uh, let Tim know in the chat uh, if you enjoyed uh, his presentation and uh, if you learned anything tonight. Uh, Michelle comments, this was such an interesting subject. Thank you. Um, uh, we addressed Wendy's question. Thank you for your question, Wendy. Uh, Cindy asks, is there any documentation of the Clarks ever meeting Martin Luther King? Uh, yes. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, they met him on a train uh, in 1956. Uh, the Clarks and a friend of Kenneth's, a scholar friend of Kenneth's, uh, went to the South on a tour of the Southern states. Uh, and there was a terrible reaction against Brown. There was violence. There were threats against Black uh, activists. 
even threats against white liberals that uh, uh, supported integration. And uh, the NAACP was really worried about this. The uh, Atlanta Regional Council was worried about this. And the, and the council sent Kenneth and uh, Highland Lewis, his best friend at the time, and a black scholar, a sociologist, with Mamie uh, to the southern states to find out just how bad the violence was, the intimidation, the harassment. And uh, they met King on a train uh, for the first time, got to like him very much, then went to meet him again uh, once they reached Alabama, Montgomery, where the school bus boycott was being held and King was, was the leader of that movement, the spokesman and uh, central figure associated with that movement. And uh, they went to his home, which had just been firebombed. Uh, terrorists, white terrorists had firebombed the home, uh, really angry because of the uh, bus boycott. And uh, they met with King uh, and uh, there were guards, armed guards, people were walking around the property with guns uh, because it was extremely dangerous, very dangerous, very intimidating. The Clarks, <coughs> pardon me, the Clarks um, helped raise money for the Kings to help them uh, get babysitters and house cleaning because uh, Dr. King's wife was a full partner, just as Mamie was with him, and she appeared with him everywhere, and she was a very hardworking uh, advocate of his movement, and uh, that family is under a lot of stress, and the Clarks helped provide some money to pay for that, and um, they actually slept in the Clarks home in Hastings on Hudson when they were visiting him there. They met in the Caribbean and apparently uh, spent part of a weekend together uh, in the Caribbean. Um, when Martin Luther King first went to New York City, his first visit to give a speech, the man who introduced him was Kenneth Clark. There we go. And, um, uh, and if you can answer this question, um, in 60 seconds or less, uh, Dory asks, how did Kenneth and Mamie uh, come up with the idea of using dolls for their experiment? I'm not sure. That, that uh, I can't tell you. Uh, all, I can tell you all I can tell you was you often read, and I regard this as folklore uh, or wishful thinking, that Mamie came up with the idea. We don't know. We, we don't know. And Kenneth said it was a joint idea. Yeah, that, that probably sounds about right. Uh, so Rosamond says, great program, thank you. Teresa says, very interesting presentation. Diane says, thank you for sharing your book and the story of the Clarks with us. Uh, it's a part of history that I was unaware of. And Sally says, thank you for bringing this important study and the story of this dedicated couple to our attention, uh, inspiring and insightful. So Tim, my last question for you is, where can folks purchase a copy of your book? And um, uh, where uh, can folks learn more about you? Uh, well, you can buy a copy uh, through Amazon. You can buy a copy through your local independent bookstore, uh, which I'm a big supporter of. I, I hope you'll consider that first. Uh, uh, when, if you go to Amazon, do not ask for the paperback. For some reason, they're advertising paperback sales. Well, the paperback isn't published yet. That'll be next June. And so if you hit that button, they're going to say, sorry, next year. You shouldn't think then that uh, you've got to wait a year. You can get it, by the way, um, th uh, on your Kindle uh, through, through uh, Amazon. So there, there are several avenues to get that, get it that way. Um, in central Massachusetts, the library network there in the Pioneer Valley has 12 copies that I know of. So uh, there's, there's some options right there. Yeah, I haven't done my homework yet, but I, 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 so I don't know if your book is available yet in the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium, uh, but it will be soon. Okay, it's Great. on order. It's, it's, uh, we will be, we will definitely be uh, purchasing, purchasing a copy. So, uh, and then, um, 
gosh, I forget what consortium um, Ashland is. I think it's CW Mars and uh, Danvers is Noble. But anyway, uh, folks, check your local library consortiums and uh, hopefully there's copies there as well. Uh, so Tim, I want to give you a, a big thank you for uh, for donating your time tonight and for uh, telling us about this fascinating story. Uh, like Diane and several others in the chat, I was really uh, unaware uh, of, uh, of this uh, piece of history. And um, I uh, want to thank Danvers and Ashland for partnering and helping spread the word. And uh, Tim, do you have any last words before we wrap it up? Uh, just thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, keep the faith, struggle on, and we'll make this a better world and a better right. country. Yeah, and as Diane said in the chat, if your local library does not own a copy, ask them to buy one, request a purchase. <laughs> so thank you so much, Tim. Uh, folks, look for an email from me tomorrow uh, with the recording, with the feedback survey, and with information about some other upcoming virtual author visits. So thank Robert, you all so thank much. you. You're a prince. You know, thank you, Tim. Uh, everyone have a great night. Thanks again. I know. Bye-bye.